the approach for patients with suspected polyps includes obtaining a CBC for anemia and performing a colonoscopy with polypectomy biopsy. If there are no concerning features, no further treatment is required. If there are malignant features, the patient should be treated as having colorectal cancer. If there are features of hereditary polyposis syndromes, the patient should be referred to gastroenterology and genetics. Follow-up is required for all patients due to the increased risk of malignancy. Colonoscopy is the preferred method for diagnosis and management of most polyps, and advanced endoscopy techniques may be required to identify high-risk features. Recommended removal techniques for low-risk colonic polyps include cold snare polypectomy for sessile polyps lesser than 10 mm and pedunculated lesions of any size and hot snare polypectomy for pedunculated lesions greater than or equal to 10 mm. Recommended removal techniques for high-risk colonic polyps include hot or cold snare polypectomy for lesions 10 to 20 millimeters and endoscopic mural resection for lesions greater than or equal to 20 millimeters. Biopsy and referral to surgery is required for lesions with evidence of submucosal invasion. There are two main ways to classify colonic polyps, macroscopically and histologically. Macroscopically, polyps can be either pedunculated or sessile. Pedunculated polyps are attached to the gastrointestinal mucosa by a stalk, while sessile polyps have a broad base and no stalk. An example of a pedunculated polyp is a pedunculated adenomatous polyp. Histologically, there are several subtypes of colonic polyps with different characteristics and malignant potential. Inflammatory polyps, also known as pseudopolyps, are seen in inflammatory bowel disease, especially ulcerative colitis, and result from mucosal ulceration and regeneration. These polyps are multiple and benign, with a low malignant potential. Mucosal polyps are benign with no clinical significance. They are typically small, measuring less than 5 mm, and mostly appear like normal mucosa. They are often incidental findings during colonoscopy and do not require further evaluation. Submucosal polyps are also benign, and the most common subtype is submucosal lipoma. These polyps arise from the submucosal layer and usually do not cause any symptoms. They are typically small and have a low malignant potential. Hyperplastic polyps are the most common type of non-neoplastic polyp among those with low malignant potential. They are small, measuring less than 5 mm, and commonly found in the distal colon, particularly the rectosigmoid. Hyperplastic polyps may transform into serrated polyps, which have a higher malignant potential. The histology of hyperplastic polyps is characterized by hyperplasia of normal cellular components with a sawtooth, serrated pattern of crypt epithelium. Hematomatous polyps may occur throughout the gastrointestinal tract and are composed of normal tissue native to the site of origin, such as the colon, but with disorganized growth. Hamartomatous polyps are associated with several syndromes, including juvenile polyposis syndrome, Peutz-Jeghers syndrome, Cowden syndrome, and Cronkite Canada syndrome. These polyps have a low malignant potential when solitary, but when associated with syndromes, there is an increased risk of colonic and extracolonic malignancies. Serrated polyps can be subdivided into sessile serrated polyps and traditional serrated adenomas. Sessile serrated polyps are sessile lesions larger than 5 mm in size and are common in the proximal colon, with a morphology similar to hyperplastic polyps. They have a moderate malignant potential, estimated at approximately 5%. Traditional serrated adenomas are common in the rectosigmoid and have a serrated architecture with dysplasia and a sawtooth pattern of crypt epithelium. Adenomatous polyps have the highest malignant potential among colonic polyps. They can be further classified into three types based on their histology, tubular adenoma, tubulovillus adenoma, and villus adenoma. Tubular adenoma is the most frequent subtype, forming tubules anywhere in the colon with a low malignant potential of less than 5%. Tubulobulus adenoma is a mixture of tubular and villus histological picture with a malignant potential estimated at approximately 20%. Villus adenoma is larger than other adenomas and often sessile, with finger-like projections lined by dysplastic epithelium. This subtype has the highest malignant potential, estimated at approximately 50%. Hereditary polyposis syndromes are genetic conditions that are associated with an increased risk of developing colon cancer and tumors in other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. There are two types of hereditary polyposis syndromes, adenomatous polyposis syndromes and hematomatous polyposis syndromes. These syndromes also have extraintestinal manifestations such as tumors, cysts, cardiac conditions, and pigmentation changes. Adenomatous polyposis syndromes are a type of hereditary polyposis syndrome that includes familial adenomatous polyposis, attenuated FAP, and MUTYH-associated polyposis. Familial adenomatous polyposis is the most common form of adenomatous polyposis syndrome, with an incidence of 1 in 7,000 to 30,000 births. 
It is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and is caused by mutations in the APC gene found in 70 to 90 percent of patients. FAP is characterized by the development of more than 100 adenomatous polyps throughout the colorectum, which puts patients at a 100 percent lifetime risk of colorectal cancer, typically developing at 35 to 40 years of age. FAP also carries an increased risk of gastric and pancreatic cancer. Classic FAP has no extraintestinal manifestations, while Gardner syndrome, a subtype of FAP, has bony and or soft tissue tumors, cutaneous lesions, supernumerary and or impacted teeth, and congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Turcot syndrome is another variant of FAP but is also associated with Lynch syndrome and is characterized by malignant brain tumors. The recommended management for FAP includes referral to gastroenterology, surveillance for intestinal and extraintestinal malignancies, and prophylactic proctocolectomy with ileonal anastomosis or ileostomy. Attenuated FAP is a milder form of FAP with delayed onset compared to classic FAP with a lifetime colorectal cancer risk of approximately 70% and typically occurring at around 55 years of age. Attenuated FAP is characterized by 10 to 99 adenomatous polyps, typically located more proximally than in classic FAP. The recommended management for attenuated FAP is similar to FAP, including surveillance and colon polypectomy that may delay or obviate the need for preventive surgery. MUTYH-associated polyposis is a rare autosomal recessive form of adenomatous polyposis syndrome with a lifetime colorectal cancer risk of 43 to 100 percent, typically occurring at around 50 years of age. MUTYH-associated polyposis is caused by mutations in the MUTYH gene found in 16 to 40 percent of patients and is characterized by 20 to 99 colorectal adenomatous polyps. MUTYH associated polyposis also carries an increased risk of ovarian, endometrial, breast, thyroid, and skin cancers. The recommended management for MUTYH associated polyposis includes surveillance, colon polypectomy, and surgery referral if there are too many polyps to manage endoscopically. Individuals with hereditary polyposis syndromes should undergo early and regular screening and be referred for genetic counseling. At risk family members who decline genetic testing should undergo the same endoscopic surveillance as individuals with known mutations. Hematomatous polyposis syndromes are a group of inherited disorders characterized by the development of multiple hematomatous polyps throughout the gastrointestinal tract. These polyps are benign but can cause GI bleeding, abdominal pain, or obstruction, and increase the risk of developing various GI tract malignancies. Here is a summary of three hematomatous polyposis syndromes. Hutz Jeggers syndrome. PJS is an autosomal dominant disorder characterized by the development of hematomatous polyps throughout the GI tract as well as mucocutaneous hyperpigmented macules. PJS patients have an increased risk of developing colorectal cancer, as well as other GI tract and non-GI tract cancers. Baseline colonoscopy, esophagoga straduodonoscopy, and videocapsule endoscopy should be performed at age 8, and surveillance for associated cancers should be performed annually. Juvenile polyposis syndrome, JPS is also an autosomal dominant disorder characterized by the development of hematomatous polyps throughout the GI tract, which can cause GI bleeding and anemia. JPS patients have an increased risk of developing colorectal cancer as well as other GI tract malignancies and extraintestinal manifestations such as hemorrhagic telangiectasias, structural heart disease, epilepsy, macrocephaly, and hydrocephalus. Surveillance colonoscopy and EGD should be performed every 1 to 3 years starting at age 12 to 15, and annual cardiovascular exams and CBC should be performed if SMAD4 mutation is present. Cowden syndrome. Cowden syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder characterized by the development of multiple hematomatous polyps throughout the GI tract, skin papules, and hyperkeratosis, and an increased risk of developing breast, thyroid, and endometrial tumors. Patients with Cowden syndrome have a lower risk of colorectal cancer than those with PJS or JPS, and surveillance colonoscopy and EGD should be performed every two years starting at age 15. Treatment for all three syndromes involves colon polypectomy, and surgery may be necessary if there are too many polyps to manage endoscopically or if there are significant symptoms of colonic polyps. Non-hereditary polyposis syndromes, serrated polyposis syndrome, a condition in which multiple serrated polyps form in the colon, which is associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. The cause is unclear, but smoking may be a risk factor, and there may be a familial association. The diagnostic finding is serrated polyps throughout the colon. Management involves surveillance colonoscopy every one to three years with polypectomy of all polyps greater than 5 mm. Surgery may be required if there are too many polyps to manage endoscopically. Cronkite Canada syndrome, an extremely rare form of non-hereditary hematomatous polyposis, which is associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. The cause is unclear, but it is likely immune-mediated. 
The clinical features usually manifest in individuals around 60 years of age and include symptoms of colonic pox, protein-losing enteropathy, ectodermal changes, sepsis, and congestive heart failure. The diagnostic finding is numerous hematomatous polyps with inflammatory changes within the polyps. Management involves nutritional support for protein loss from chronic diarrhea and immune suppression with glucocorticoids or azathioprine. Cancer screening is usually performed annually, but optimal intervals are unclear. Endoscopic colon polypectomy is a minimally invasive procedure used to remove polyps from the colon. There are two techniques for endoscopic polypectomy, snare polypectomy and endoscopic mucosal resection. Snare polypectomy involves using a thin wire snare to encircle the polyp, including a margin of healthy tissue. The snare is then tightened and retracted, cutting through the tissue. This procedure can be performed with or without electrocautery. Endoscopic mucosal resection involves injecting the submucosa beneath the polyp to lift it away from the deeper mucosa. A snare is then used to excise the polyp. Complications of endoscopic colon polypectomy include postpolypectomy bleeding, bowel perforation, and postpolypectomy coagulation syndrome. Postpolypectomy bleeding is lower gastrointestinal bleeding that can occur up to 30 days after the procedure. Risk factors for postpolypectomy bleeding include anticoagulant use, chronic renal disease, cardiovascular disease, large polyp size, and polyps located in the ascending colon. Intraprocedural bleeding should be managed with endoscopic hemostases, while postprocedural bleeding requires stabilization of patients with hemorrhagic shock and urgent consultation with gastroenterology. Paraprocedural measures can be taken to prevent postpolypectomy bleeding, such as paraprocedural management of oral anticoagulant therapy for patients on anticoagulants, negation of pedunculated polyps greater than or equal to 20 mm prior to removal, and injection of a vasoconstrictor. Bowel perforation is another complication that may occur during endoscopic colon polyp if suspected or confirmed malignancy is present, colon resection may be required. Additionally, hereditary polyposis syndromes may require surgical polyp removal and or colonic resection, especially for large polyps. After a patient undergoes polypectomy or biopsy, follow-up is essential to monitor for any signs of recurrent or new polyps. The recommended interval for repeat colonoscopy is based on the risk category determined by the histology of the polyp and the patient's risk factors for CRC. For very low-risk patients, repeat colonoscopy should be performed every 10 years, while low-risk patients should have it done every 7 to 10 years. Intermediate risk patients should have repeat colonoscopy every 3 to 5 years, and high-risk patients every 3 years. For patients with very high risk, for example, greater than 10 adenomas, repeat colonoscopy should be done every year. It is important to note that these recommendations are for patients with no additional risk factors. For individuals at high risk of CRC or with hereditary polyposis syndromes, follow condition-specific screening procedures.